I believe. I believe. I believe. I remember going to church as an adult, right, for the first time when I started going to church. And I would walk in, and the pastor was like, he said, I want you to pray with your neighbor. And I'm like, well, my neighbor don't go to this church. I don't know. You, know you want me to call my neighbor on the phone? That's creepy. I ain't going to do that. Right, then they explained to me, right, your neighbor is a person sitting next to you. Listen, I'm brand new at this Christian stuff. I don't, not... I didn't even know you're supposed to pray out loud, let alone with this lady. I don't even know this lady. What am I supposed to pray about? Lord, help these bumps go down on this lady's face. I don't know what I'm supposed to pray about. I don't know what I'm supposed to pray about, right? She went first. She was praying all good. and She must have been John the Baptist's little sister or something. Pray. She was like, dear Heavenly Father, you said in your word in the sixth chapter, the third, third verse of the book of Matthew, the 601st word on page 1248. <laughs> Lord, you said, but seek, S is in search, E is in everywhere, E is in excellent, K is in kingdom. <laughs> you have an Alpha Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha. I'm thinking, man, she even know his nicknames. Now it's my turn to pray, right? But I don't got the spiritual vocabulary to just, but I'm not gonna let her out pray me. So I'm like, okay, God, first of all, you are good people. You know, you are good, Lord. You are good. You are good to the last drop, Lord. Um, Cause Lord, I, I just gotta obey my thirst, Lord. You know, cause choosing moms choose Jesus. So, Lord, cause, you no, know, as the rec as the rocket's red glare, Lord, it gave proof to the night, Lord. I believe I can fly, amen. <laughs> uh, that is uh, Michael Jr., absolutely exceptional uh, comedian. But uh, welcome, welcome to Epiphany Station. Welcome uh, this morning to this, uh, our 12th week on a series that we call Believe. Um, just let me know what, you, what we're doing here. While uh, Pastor Jeff is taking his much-deserved vacation, we're actually getting back into a sermon series that we started back in the fall. Um, it's this 30-week-long message and kind of teaching thing we're doing, looking at the, some of the basic stuff about Christianity. Uh, the first thing we did, and on the wall here you can see 10 posters in a row along the top, and those kind of are, are picture representations of the 10 core beliefs of a Christian or of the, of, of the Christian faith. Ten things that are, we find in God's Word and we say that we believe. And then the next ten weeks, and what we kind of started doing last week and what we'll be doing for the next nine weeks, is looking at the ten kind of core practices. If we believe those ten things, well, how does that interact with us in our daily lives? What do we do about that? How do we respond to that? And then in Easter, we're going to be starting the last ten-week block, which will be about how, if we believe these things and we, we do some things to interact with that, how does that change us? What does that do to our character? How does that create virtues inside of us? So really, you might see this if you're in a GPS group, which is kind of on our small home study group. So when you have these books as well, that there's this uh, kind of tagline of think, act, be. The first 10 weeks is about thinking and, and having the belief. And, and the second is be, uh, sorry, is act, is, is practicing and taking on these principles of, of engaging with them. And the third is be, all really driving us to a point of to think and act and be like Christ. So that's kind of what we're doing, and if you have the, uh, the ability to be here last week, you saw that uh, the worship team actually did an exceptional job of speaking on the subject of worship, which kind of falls in line. Um, but that's because the first core belief that we had all the way back in September was that God is a big God. 
And the way that that interacts with us and the way that we respond to that is because he's a big God, because he created everything, because he keeps us existing just by his power, that that calls us to worship him. And what we're talking about today in our second core belief is that God is a personal God, that he is actually interested in your daily life and, and how you go about living your existence here on earth. He has investment in that. And if he is a personal God, well, then that pushes us and draws us to the topic of prayer. And before we go into it, before we go into what prayer is, I just kind of want to highlight um, what Jeff talked about all those weeks ago about our God being a personal God. If you missed any of these messages at any point and you want to kind of catch up and see where we are, you can go to epiphanystation.com and go into the media center and you can find everything we've done there for the past five years. You could just take a couple of weeks off work and just kind of find what we've been doing for quite a while. But what Jeff talked about is that this God, this God is so big yet so personal. And we can go throughout the Bible and we can look for these examples of this. But one of the most telling ones is uh, a guy called David uh, would write down some of these prayers he would send to God, some of the things he would think about, some of these things that he would sing to God. And we find them in a book in the Old Testament called Psalms. These things that he would declare about God or, or questions he would have to him. And one of them really drives this point home that God is personal. He says, when I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. Really what he's saying there is, my goodness, if you're this huge, massive God that set that sun in place and you keep the world spinning, who are you that you should even care about me? Yet you do. Yet you do and you glorify and you honor us as human beings and give us authority over stuff. Really what we're talking about here is if this is the God that we, we believe in, if this is the God that we serve, well then that draws us to this idea of prayer. Because if God's personal, it means he wants to know about you. He wants you to want to know about him. You know, it's kind of like that thing, if you haven't had your wife say it to you yet or you're not married, the day will come in which she says, I don't want you to just want to do it. I want you to want to do it. And what does that even mean? But <laughs> it's the idea that God doesn't just want us to pray out of guilt or of obligation. He wants us to want to talk to him. And that's why prayer exists. One of other David's other declarations about prayer and about how personally interested God is, he says this, Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. For I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love. If that's our God, if that's the one that we believe in and we serve, what does that mean to us today? Uh, if you've got a program as you're handed in, um, on the inside is a message outline. You can kind of follow along with what we're doing today. There's two purposes to the message outline. One, so you can make notes and take stuff away and, and ponder it further. The other, it's a great timeline for working out how quickly you can get out of here and get to lunch um, to see if you can make kickoff because you can kind of see where I'm at in the whole thing. But the first thing in that message outline is that prayer is communication. Quite simply, prayer is a form of communication. The problem is, is that over time, and depending on our experience with church and with prayer, is the waters can be a little bit muddied about what prayer actually is. If you go to the dictionary, it says things like, it is a devout petition to God, or a spiritual communion, or a beseeching, or an invocation. Well, for me, that doesn't clear anything up at all, and really gets you to the point of not being able to see the wood for the trees. The Bible is very clear and honest and stark about prayer, what it is and why it is. It's mentioned some 300 plus times with the purpose of empowering us to go and get engaged in it. And one of the clearest depictions or teachings about prayer actually comes from Jesus. When his followers come up to him and they're, they're seeking, okay, tell us how to pray, he doesn't hold back from that, he doesn't hold any punches and he gives them a lot of practical advice followed by some confidence they can have in prayer. The interaction is this. It says, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and don't let us yield to temptation. 
depending on your, your background, um, you may have heard that before in kind of different wording. It's commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer, uh, even though that name's always confused me because it's not actually Jesus's prayer, it's the prayer that we're supposed to pray. So it's more like the people's prayer. But let's not get into that. That's not that important. But what he does, he starts out giving us this very practical layout, pray like this. Then he follows that up with a, a story. We call it a parable. It's basically um, a teaching moment that he says, okay, this is what I need you to understand about prayer while you're going into it. And he gives them this example. He says, so, and I'm paraphrasing, so don't quote me. Uh, he says, so, as you're going to pray, imagine prayer being kind of like this. Imagine a relative comes around to your house unexpected, and um, knowing good hospitality, you want to give them tea and crumpets as they're in your house, because everyone knows that is the greatest way to show hospitality. Um, <laughs> You can give them coffee and cookies, but let's be honest, you only do that if you don't like them. So you, you want to give them tea, but you don't have any tea bags in the house. So you go to your next door neighbor and you knock on their door and you say, shouting through the door, hey, I need, some, I need something for my friend. And your, your neighbor shouts from the couch, I'm watching the voice, go away. And at that point, Jesus comes in and says, okay, in that instance, this is what you can learn and understand about prayer. Even if that point a flawed human being who does not have the same love for you that God wants, if you at that point persist shamelessly in your knocking, they will eventually open the door. If you are willing to stand there and annoy them to the point that they can't hear terrible people singing on the TV screen, they will come and get rid of you by giving you whatever, they, whatever you want. And he's basically saying that, that that's what an imperfect person, how they would respond. Imagine how God responds goes into another way and says, you guys know how to give good gifts to your kids. If they come up to you and ask for an apple, you don't give them a grenade. If they come up to you and say they're hungry, you don't tell them to go suck a rock. So if we know, as human beings, flawed as we are, we know how to give kids what they need, and we know how to give gifts, imagine how, a better, how much better a perfect God knows how to give gifts to his kids and knows how to give them exactly what they need. And in all of this, what he's basically saying is, Although it might be different in the world, with God, if you ask what you want, you'll receive what you need. If you seek him, you'll find him. And if you knock on the door, the door will be open to you. So the real big question is, what is prayer? And, and, and really, it's, it's kind of like inception. It's a question within a question. It's not just what is prayer, but what is prayer to us? And what is prayer to God? Well, prayer to us is just simply a conversation with a loving father. Jesus lines up this template, this Lord's Prayer, by saying, Father. And going back to the original meaning of the word that he wrote, it's not like, you know, kind of quietly, respectfully tucked in the corner saying, Father. It's more Daddy, Papa. Um, it's kind of that affectionate name for your parent. And what he's saying is, you get to say that and go to him in that regard in prayer because he wants you to. He wants you to view him that way. He wants you to come and talk to him that way. And something that Gretchen talked about last week in worship, she said, the thing that she loves about God is that God is a gentleman. And God will not kick the door down and make him. And that's the same in prayer. God is not going to strong arm you into talking to him. But is, his desire for that to happen is always there and it's always constant. And that is why prayer exists. Because the way I see it, of all things that are removable from us, prayer is not. If you cannot see and cannot hear and cannot speak and cannot walk and cannot talk and if you are imprisoned or if you are free, whatever, prayer is available to you. It's like that constant lifeline that no matter what's going on, no matter where you're at, no matter what situation you find yourself, prayer is available. And to see that because God has this unchanging desire, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, still wants you to talk to him. Still is just craving people to come and speak with him. And where in the world our shameless persistence in those circumstances might meet with a slam door or a punch in the face or a grenade, depending on where you live, what God is saying is it's different with him, is that he actually loves that shameless persistence with him. He loves you to see coming to him, asking for stuff. Now, throughout all of these series, what we always have and what you have in your day is a key question and a key belief. The key question this week is, okay, so what? What happens when I communicate with God? What, why should I pray? Why would I pray? And the key belief that we stand on is I pray to God to know him, to find direction for my life, and to lay my requests before him. 
And that's kind of the second point in the message outline is that prayer is for connection. Prayer is to connect us to God. And it's not just kind of like um, our, our immediate broadest sense of, of connection with God, of checking in and a little bit of chit and a little bit of chat. Instead, how Jesus models it and how Jesus gives us this, this template of prayer, he's not saying you have to say these words. He's saying, but there are some certain things for you to get done in prayer. This can be helpful for task-oriented individuals, mainly guys. Jesus is actually talking about go get some stuff done in prayer. Don't just be idle in the way that you walk into it. Go and seek some stuff and get some stuff done. So let's just quickly review what he says. Jesus said this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Now, with, as we talk about these 10 weeks of practices, what we really want to do is spend a lot of time on application. Because if we talk about practice, what's the point in talking about what we believe if we don't give us something to do in response? So we're going to be looking at the next steps. We're going to be looking at what we do about that. And this is where we begin. One of the first purposes I see in prayer in Jesus' format is it's to connect our purpose to God's plan. First line is, Father, may your name be kept holy. The idea of this is for us to connect in with God's mission. And it might not seem that in the first reading of it. But God has this crazy idea, this, this crazy mission to see all people come to him. It's this crazy idea that every single person on earth gets to receive his love if they want. It doesn't matter about your past. It doesn't matter about your personality. And thank God it doesn't matter about your nationality. But what he's saying is, in his book, in the Bible... If you can name them, I want them. From, e- from everything on the spectrum, from presidents to preachers to prostitutes, or from terrorists to televangelists, God wants them. From the person and the people that you know that God is interested in, he's after them. From the person you know God has no interest in. And wherever you fall on that spectrum, God wants all of them. And this plan he's got, this mission he's got, involves us. And this is where this first line of prayer is important. Because what he's really saying is, go to God in prayer to get to know him. Or it says, your Father, may your name be kept holy. I think we can read it one way and, and we can read it another. The way that I first read it as a kid was, oh gosh darn, I hope your name becomes un- doesn't become unholy at some point. Because that would suck. Can you make sure that it stays holy for me? That, in every form, is ridiculous. The idea that we need to tell God, please keep your name holy. That, just, that doesn't hold any water. The way I read it these days and the way I come to understand it is God doesn't need direction about the holiness of his name. We do. And what it really says is, Father, may your name be kept holy. I seek, Father, God, help me understand the holiness of your name. For holy means to be set apart, to be lifted up, to be exceptional, to be different. God, help me get that. Help me understand the importance of your name and what it means in my life and for every single person around me. And that's really what we're talking about is help me get on mission. Help me understand what you're doing and what you believe about everyone else and me. Because whether you realize it or not, if you claim to be a Christian, you are wearing that title everywhere. It's on your sleeve. It's on your ski mask. It's everywhere. You can't get away from the fact that people are looking at you and thinking, that's a Christian. And they are going to be viewing you and viewing God's name through you. When Jesus says, okay, you need to pray before you do anything else, Say, Father, may your name be kept holy. Really what it's going for is, Father, what he's saying is it's a good idea if you check in with the Father, check in with God, check in with the boss and say, before I do anything else, before I pray for anything else, before I go anywhere, can you make sure that I know what your name means? Can can you please help me understand what I need to view your name as and what I need to view you as before we do anything else? to Help me understand what you want me to do. The next thing he prays is, Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. This is where we have our second point. This is where we connect our place on the pecking order to God's position. May your kingdom come soon. I think there's a simple purpose to this, and it's that we're asking God to come down and take mastery over every single portion of everything ever. But there's something about praying, may your kingdom come soon, that is necessary for you to pray it. And I'm going to make a claim here, and if you don't agree with me, feel free to disagree, but disagree silently. And don't write it on your connection card, because if Jeff sees those, I'll get in trouble. But (laughs) I believe 
that it is impossible to go to prayer, to go to God in prayer, if you think you're greater than Him. I think it's impossible to go to someone asking, seeking, searching, if you think you're already greater than them. The Bible talks a lot about humility, this idea that we are not to be arrogant people, we're not to be prideful. When it comes to prayer, there's kind of an unparalleled importance to that command and that direction. Jesus spends a little bit of time when he's talking, to prayer, talking about prayer to his followers to make sure they understand this. One of the times he's speaking about hypocritical prayer and he basically says this, don't pray like a moron. Morons go out into the places where everyone can see them and they stand and they shout their prayers loudly so everybody else can hear them. What I want you to do is, I want you, when you pray, I want you to go away and I want you to shut the door and I want you to be quiet and I want you to speak to God from your heart. God already knows what you're going to say. That's not what's important. And really what he's saying at that point is, if your prayers, if our prayers are for other people's ears, that's as far as they go. Now, I'm not saying we don't pray for people, we don't pray with people, but if our intent is to be heard so we get some sort of a claim or gain or, or spiritual stature, and we say that I'm awesome at prayer, I'm spiritual, well, at that point, that's as far as your prayers will ever go. God isn't listening. What he's talking about is if your prayers are to connect with him and have that purposeful intention, that's where he hears you, that's where he sees your heart in the matter. He goes on to say, don't babble on saying words after words after words. Don't think you have to use a spiritual vocabulary. That's what other people do. That's what other religions do. God's interested in the heart behind the words instead of the words. See, God knows exactly what you're going to say. If he's this big, awesome, powerful God, he knows the words you're going to say. So actually the words you, that come out of your mouth, it's not necessary for him to hear them so that you can inform him of something. Instead, what he's looking for and what he de desires in prayer is the act of doing it. Because the act of actually praying means that you're calling on something greater than yourself. And you're willing to say, you're the king and I am not. And it is an act of submission. So when we say, may your kingdom come soon, what it's really talking to is, if you, you can't say, may your kingdom come soon, if you don't believe there's a king. So you can't go before and say this if you think you're the king. You can't go before this if you think you have some sort of stature above God or above anybody else. And it's important for us to know this because playing God sucks. If you've ever tried it, you know it sucks. If you're thinking about it, don't. Because it only brings pain and it only brings frustration, thinking that you're responsible and you're all-powerful. And as soon as you think that you can go to prayer thinking that you're better than others... That sucks too. You get, lo you get lost in the idea that, that you're somehow special and that God thinks that you're greater than anybody else. You completely lose sight of mission. It's, it's hard for us to submit. Let's be honest. We're a rebellious sort. And it's hard for us to have this idea that somebody has mastery or rulership over us. It's easier for me because I'm from England and we've got an awesome queen. You guys, this is the land of the free. You don't need that. But... There are times when we all like, we all like the portion of that relationship when we get protection or when we get provision and when we get care and when we get love from the one that is ruling over us. And that's what God's talking about. If both those elements are important, you can't have one without the other. You need to call him king so you get the benefits of everything else. And the act of prayer is not informing him. It's you being informed by your place on the pecking order and taking comfort in that. The third and final point that I see from, from Jesus' model is for us to connect our pleas with God's promises. <clears throat> now, this is maybe one of the more common things that we find ourselves going to in prayer, but it's also one of the, the trickiest for us to uh, maybe believe in or understand. It's that point in which we go to God with wants and desires and needs, and we want to know that He cares about us and that He's going to do something about it. The reason that that is tricky is because this is where the rubber meets the road for a lot of us. This is where it becomes tangible. If this God is real, then something's going to happen. See, Jesus spends two-thirds of that formula, of that model of prayer, Lord's Prayer, in saying, give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us and don't let us yield to temptation. Really what he's talking about there is pouring out and pleading for provision and relief from not just spiritual things, but mental things and physical things too. 
We have this idea that God is just interested in our, in our spiritual life on a Sunday morning. No, God has an interest in every single facet of your life. And what this prayer shows is that he does. If he didn't care, Jesus wouldn't have said to ask. God has this intention of, of seeing you grow and mature and be healthy physically, mentally, and spiritually. And we get to go and ask for that. But where it gets tricky, like I said, where the road is, what happens when nothing happens? What happens when we do pray about these things and nothing goes on? What about when we do pray and we feel like he's not answering us or he gives us the answer we don't want? Well, that can really give us an issue in being able to believe that he is a personal God. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible. If you read them the way you want to read them, they say something like this. If you ask for it, God will give it to you. If you want it, it's yours. And it's very easy to find those and pick those out and, and stand on those. What's difficult and what's tricky is that sometimes I think we misunderstand a lot of those types of verses, a lot of those types of promises. If God is, has this plan and has this purpose that is greater than ours, if he has kingship, well then the idea that we could go to God in prayer and sway him doesn't hold water, doesn't fall into that. Instead, what we do find is that we don't sway God. When we go to him in prayer, he gets to sway us. We find the example of this um, in one of Jesus' more raw moments in the Bible where we get to see his humanity and just his authenticity, something that we can actually relate to, is a little while before he's betrayed and then beaten and, and put on trial and crucified, Jesus goes to prayer, and, it, and this is what we see him do. It says, he went on a little farther and bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, daddy, papa, if it is possible... Let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. It's where Jesus says, I know what's coming. I know what, what's going to happen. I don't want it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go through it. I need you to take it away from me if you can. And this is where we don't need to feel guilty in prayer. If Jesus can do that, if Jesus can say that, we get an ability to say that too. When you're facing illness and sickness, when you've got cancer, when you're facing terminal prospects, you get to say, God, I don't want it. Take it away from me. When you've got a loss of a loved one, you've got grief, you've got pain, you've got anger, you've got something in your life that you no longer want to be there, Jesus, in his example, says, please take it from me. I don't want to live with it anymore. The difference between Jesus and us a lot of the times, though, is that not, is not where he finishes his prayer finishes his prayer by saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me yet. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus is about to go through hell, figuratively and literally. He knows what is before him. He knows what's set out. He doesn't want it. But if God needs to use it, if God wants to do something through it, with it, then let him do it. We don't go to God to sway his decision or sway his plan or sway his position. Instead, when we go and we connect with God in prayer with our pleas and look at his promises, what happens is he gets to sway our hearts. When we're going in and we want to take our desires to him and have him answer those how we want, instead he comes back and he works on our heart's desire to see his mission and see his purpose and plan. And this is why I know people with joy with cancer. This is why I know people who are living happily knowing they're dying soon. Because these sorts of people are there. They know that, they see that, and they're saying to God, I don't want it, take it yet. If this is your will, I'll do it. So this is where we're going to finish up. Big question, why pray? What happens to me when I communicate with God? Well, what's important to know is that we don't change God through prayer. God gets an opportunity to change us. We go to prayer so God can change and grow who we are so we're more like him every day. The question is at the end of all of this and all of these practices is going to be, are we going to bother? Are we going to make any of these practices a part of our lives? Well, the only other thing I'll say is, sucks when you don't. When your life is void of prayer, when my life has been void of prayer, life sucks. It's a less life, it's a harder life. Because when I don't connect my plan to his purpose, when I don't connect my place to his position and my pleas to his promise, that's when I get overwhelmed. 
That's when I start to feel defeated and purposeless and passionless and hopeless. And that's when we implode and we crash and burn. The hope is that you'll be inspired to see what God's vision is for your prayer life. Because it is God's vision for it. And that you'll be inspired to go and do something about it. And with all the practices, that you'll be equipped and you'll know how to go and do something with it. At the end of the day, when it comes to prayer, one of the hardest things is being intimidated. Being intimidated by the idea of going before God in prayer. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. If you can, when you're considering prayer, try and envision God as he says he is. And with all due respect and awe and reverence to him, you can imagine him as a loving parent waiting for a kid to come back from camp and tell him all about it. It's like a spouse waiting at the airport awaiting their partner to come off the plane. It's like a man waiting at the end of the aisle for his bride. That's the kind of anticipation God has for us to get up the aisle and come and talk to him. That's what he's waiting for. That's what he desires. So we don't need to feel intimidated. We don't feel, need to feel like we're going to get slapped across the face with a rock. Instead, know and understand God's desire for you to get there and God's passion for you to come and connect with him. Because it starts when we start. And it goes as deep as we're going to let it go deep. And it's going to change us as much as we believe in it and practice it. And this is kind of ironic, but would, as we close, would you all pray with me? Father God, I thank you for the gift of prayer. That um, it is an example of your personal desire to know us and to love us and to, to show us uh, the life you have for us. We thank you that you are a personal God, that you are desirous to know us intimately, know our pains, know our struggles from our heart, not through our words. That you want to help us see that you do have kingship and that we have the ability to be protected and provided for by you. Help us to go into prayer with the right attitude and the right spirit of seeing your will done. I ask you to convict us all going out of here uh, to come and talk to you today and this week, this month. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, and we're just about to hear uh, very shortly from uh, our very own Millie Westerman on her epiphany on prayer. This is kind of that thing that Jeff was talking about um, where you're kind of sitting on the fence with your kids. It is raw, it is passionate. Um, so you can make that decision for yourselves. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Millie Westerman. For those of you that don't know me, um, I've recently been hired here at Epiphany Station as the Administrative Assistant. And today I wanted to share with everybody a few things that God has done in my life through prayer. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I um, did not have a great life growing up. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was young and my dad left and I struggled with um, drugs and alcohol and sex trying to find something that would fill that hole and that pain in my life and nothing ever did until I was about 17 and some kids from high school um, just set an example that I couldn't I, I couldn't look past there was something different about them and now I know that I saw Jesus in them and I gave my life to Christ and um, while I was in high school I went on a, <clears throat> a retreat and at this retreat, the speaker was talking about how God forgives us for our sin. And he had these crosses laid out all around the retreat in different corners and stuff. And he had bowls full of uh, little trinkets that represented our sin. So there's a rock for a hard heart and a little mirror for vanity and that sort of thing. And um, he preached a really convicting message and my heart was just broken over my sin. And so I went and I collected the things that I felt like God was telling me I needed to confess and I had them in my hand and I kneeled down at the foot of the cross and I set them down there and when I did and I asked God to forgive me I felt uh, the Lord say to me if I can forgive you for all these things that you've done all the sin that you've committed and, and all the decisions that you've made and the ways that you've hurt people and, and if I can forgive you for all of that then why can't you forgive your father for leaving and it was right then that I realized that I had been holding unforgiveness towards him I had been um, holding bitterness and anger and resentment and I made a choice at that time that I was going to forgive him and I forgave him and it was like a burden was literally lifted off my back. 
And um, the next thing is something that is really hard for me to share. Um, I don't normally share it in front of a large group of people, and I feel like I'm sharing this with you guys will maybe bring some healing to some of you. So, um, when I was six years old, I was raped for the first time, and um, it caused all kinds of problems in my life, uh, mistrust and isolation, fear and anger and pain. Uh, my heart just kind of broken, feelings of worthlessness and loneliness and everything that comes along with that kind of thing. As I allowed myself to start the emotions that I had because of that, I um, started crying out to God and saying, why? Why, God, did you let this happen to me? And um, God didn't answer that prayer. And I, I still don't know the answer to that. Um, but what did happen is, is I said, where were you? If you were my father and if you loved me, where were you when I was raped? And at first I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said I was holding your hand. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Holding my hand. And then I thought about it. And I was like, that's ridiculous. I got a little bit angry. And I'm like, you know what, God? If you love me, if you're faithful, if you're my father, if you want the best for me, then where were you? Holding my hand while I'm being raped is not enough. That doesn't show me anything except that you're going to stand by and watch me get hurt. Right then, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you are a daughter of mine. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. That means that I live within you. Everything that happened to you, happened to me. Everything that you felt, I felt. Everything that you struggled with, I struggled with. And I realized right then, for the first time, that we aren't alone. That Jesus has been with us and he knows our pain. And although we may not understand it, we may not get the answers why, why it happened, we are able to uh, have the assurance that Jesus is with us and he understands our pain more than any person can. And he's waiting for each one of us to come to him with our brokenness, with our anger, and to lay it out before him. He's big enough to take the questions and the anger and the fear and the doubt, and he uses those things to show himself to us. Just want to remind everyone that, you know, through prayer, we have the ability to be forgiven for our sins, but God also asks us to forgive others. He says in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ I have forgiven you. And also that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. And when we come to him with our brokenness and our wounds and all the things that are wrong with us, he takes them. He draws near to us, and he binds us up. I pray that uh, what I've said today will touch your heart and that you will ask God those questions. I'm Millie, and that's my epiphany.